It's the 500th anniversary of the birth of John Calvin. Unfortunately, I missed 1983 with you. That was Martin Luther's birthday, and 1984 was Swingley's 500th birthday, and I wasn't uh, here. But I was in Switzerland at the time, uh, in Zurich, uh, doing my studies there at the Grossmünster, exactly where uh, Swingley uh, was the pastor during this is a uh, portion of the Reformation. I thought it would be fun to use our Pentecost series, which we always use for some church history uh, lesson, to look at some of the reformers. So we're doing that with Luther and Zwingli and Calvin, and then we'll have a little look at some Anabaptist uh, uh, figures as well. Um, Luther is the logical starting point, and I've invited um, uh, Reverend uh, Eric Andre from First Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church over on Neville Street uh, to come. He's our uh, campus ministry president for the uh, for the University of Pittsburgh Association of Chaplaincies. Have you also been that for Carnegie Mellon? Not Carnegie Mellon, no. Okay, just it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. So, uh, and you can't get rid of that one, it's, it's hard. <laughs> but uh, I've known Eric now, gosh, maybe almost 10 years now. Yeah, eight and a half years. Eight and a half years. Okay. Uh, he works with Doug Spatel over at uh, First Trinity. Uh, Doug was here last year when we were talking about Trinitarian uh, topics, and um, and Eric uh, has uh, his ancestry is is Swedish, I believe, and um, uh, uh, Lutheran, of course. And so he comes to us tonight to present on Luther, and I've uh, enjoyed working with him. I know you'll enjoy hearing him tonight. So I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Before uh, I, I give the, the lecture proper, um, I thought it would be very appropriate to begin these Pentecost studies uh, among you, my, my brothers and sisters in Christ, with a devotional reading from Luther based on the gospel lesson for Pentecost Sunday, this past Sunday, from St. John. Jesus said, When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Luther comments, Here Christ defines the Holy Spirit's office and points out what and about what he is to teach. He constantly keeps in mind the false spirits and preachers who boastfully claim to have the Holy Spirit, as well as others do and allege that what they say has emanated from the Holy Spirit. Thus the Holy Spirit establishes a wide difference among teachers and gives the right rule by which the spirits are to be tested. He wants to say that there are two kinds of teachers. There are some who speak on their own authority, that is, they evolve their message from their own reasoning or religious zeal and judgment. The Holy Spirit is not to be that kind of preacher, for he will not speak on his own authority, and his message will not be a human dream and thought like that of the preachers who speak on their own authority, the things which they have neither seen nor experienced. And as St. Paul says in 1 Timothy, who talk without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make assertions. No, Christ says. His message will have substance. It will be the certain and absolute truth, for he will preach what he receives from the Father and from me. And you will be able to recognize him by the fact that he does not speak on his own authority, as the spirit lies, the devil and his mobs do, but will preach about what he will hear. Thus he will speak exclusively of me, says Christ, and will glorify me, so that the people will believe in me. In this way, Christ sets bounds for the message of the Holy Spirit himself, he is not to preach anything new or anything else than Christ and his world. Let us pray in the words of Luther's evening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray you to forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Martin Luther hated God. In 1545, the year before his death, he reflected on his time in the monastery over 25 years earlier. Quote, 
Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that anything that I thought or did or prayed satisfied God. And so I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. And secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God and said, as if indeed it is not enough that miserable sinners eternally lost through original sin are crushed by every kind of calamity by the law of the Ten Commandments without having God add pain to pain by threatening us with his righteousness and wrath. Thus I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. I begin with this quote because it sets the tone for Luther's theology and his life's work. Luther sought above all and always to comfort and console the troubled, that they might have the free conscience that comes through faith alone in the gospel which is the good news of free salvation, that is, the forgiveness of sin, in Christ alone, by grace alone. The Gospel, wrote Luther, even offers counsel and help against sin in more than one way, for God is surpassingly rich in his grace. First, through the spoken word by which the forgiveness of sin, the peculiar function of the Gospel, is preached to the whole world. Second, through baptism. Third, through the holy sacrament of the altar. Fourth, through the power of the keys. And finally, through the mutual conversation and consolation of the brethren. Luther comforted and consoled the troubled in conscience with the freedom of the gospel by debating, by writing, by preaching, by teaching the word, in order to form a people who would be, as he said, theodidacti, that is, a people taught by God. As such, I will attempt to teach by doing some biography as theology, or perhaps more theology as biography. 